I'd like to share with you this morning about unrecognizable. And, and by that, I mean like when we see things or people out of their normal setting doing something different. And for a lot of the local viewers of a certain TV station, um, Joe was recognizable as the weatherman, the local weatherman. That was until he became a high-level competitor for American Ninja Warrior. <laughs> and, you know, if, if you happen to see these guys at the airport, you probably wouldn't think that much of it. You might not recognize that those guys are the last year's Super Bowl winners. Sometimes things are just unrecognizable to us. You know, even animals that have been captured, domesticated, you know, they're unrecognizable from their wild counterparts. On April 10th of 1890, the la one of the last grizzlies in southern Oregon and northern California was killed. For decades, he had been <clears throat> killing livestock, numbers estimated into the thousands. Eyewitnesses had seen him with one blow take a full-grown steer down. But he had managed to get out of traps, endure ambushes, and outlast dogs. He stood close to 12 feet tall. Now to put this in perspective for you, that beam is not a full 12 feet tall. That he weighed close to a ton. That the bullets pulled from him nearly filled a quart jar. After he was stuffed, they sent him to the World Fair in Chicago to be on display. A little unrecognizable from the bear riding the scooter at the circus, huh? Yeah. Do you know that the, the Gospels record, record some times when Jesus was unrecognizable to his disciples? And, and during those times, he taught them some things that are still relevant to us as followers of Christ today. And so I want us to look at three accounts and take note of the truths that are shown there. So the first one I want us to look at is this, this account's found in three Gospels. I want us to look at the one that's recorded in Matthew, Matthew 14, verses 22 through 33. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had set the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they had got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. I want you to catch the part that he made them get in the boat and go to the other side. It was a commandment for them. Now, for these guys that were commercial fishermen, rowing was a common, everyday thing. Yes, tedious. Yes, monotonous. 
But in this account, it later became adversity and even dangerous. I want you to know, but they didn't quit. They didn't all of a sudden decide, hey, the wind's against us. It's getting too rough out here. Let's just go back to that side. We'll just drift the wind in. Let's set up camp, spend the night there. Tomorrow morning we'll get up and we'll do this again. No, they stayed faithful, rowing. They were there the fourth watch of the night when Jesus came walking. He was unrecognizable to them. They cried out thinking it was a ghost. And, and Peter says, Lord, if it's you, command me to come. Now, no one else could authorize such a thing. No one else could authorize, yeah, get out of the boat and walk over here to me. But Peter did. He got out and obeyed the instruction to do the impossible. And probably the most recognizable truth of this account is, is the next one, that we see that focus affects our faith. If we keep our eyes on Jesus, we can do things that are impossible. When our eyes are on the storm and on the waves, it doesn't work so well for us. Matter of fact, he started to sink and he cried out, Jesus saved me, and he reached out. You see, when they got in the boat, all their perspective was changed of this man. Yes, they believed he was the Messiah. They believed he was the deliverer to come. But now they're worshiping him truly. You are the Son of God. The relevant truth I want us to, to look at here and, and to ponder today is, are we obedient? Are we obedient to everyday, monotonous, tedious things? Are we obedient to endure big and dangerous things, even to step out of the boat into the impossible things? Or do we somehow limit are obedient with, I won't ask for a show of hands, I've done this too, I don't want to do that. Just by that simple preference, I don't want to do that. We can limit our obedience to our Lord with our preferences. I'll do it when I feel like it. Or, we somehow rationalize it with, when I know the how and why of it, then I'll do it. Yes. When I know the how and why of it, have we forgotten he's a sovereign God? He doesn't have to tell us the how and the why of it. Followers of Christ are to be obedient to our Lord, whether it's small things, big things, whether we feel like it, whether we understand it, we are to be obedient. The second thing, maybe some of you can remember the first time you saw somebody get angry. Somebody that you had never seen angry before, and it seemed unusual, it seemed out of place for them to be angry. It almost made them unrecognizable. I want us to look at the account in Matthew 16 of when Jesus is sharing some things with his followers, with his close disciples. Starting in verse 21, we'll look at verse 21 to 23. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests, scribes, be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began rebuking him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Jesus instantly confronted Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan. The truth was that he shared with Peter was, You desire the things of men. Remember the prophet Isaiah informed us of this truth. He verbalized this truth. It's found in Isaiah 55, 8, and 9. 
for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Jesus was foretelling them of his suffering and death. He was sharing with them the truth that the fulfillment of God's plan for atonement and salvation was going to be on the cross. They, they didn't get that then. They didn't get that for quite some time. But Jesus wasn't done teaching them because in the next few verses, Jesus summarizes both the commitment that's necessary to follow Christ and the stakes involved. I want us to look at Matthew 16, verses 24 through 26. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? He was teaching that there has to be a willingness to deny self. That we are to be committed to follow Jesus even to death. And the stakes involved? It's our own soul. Eternal life. The probing question that's still very relevant, what would it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Jesus was teaching this in a moment that maybe they didn't recognize what he was trying to say, and he approached it in a different way. The next thing I'd like us to look at is found in Luke it's found in Luke 22, verses 31 to 34. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. You know, we all, I suppose, have perceptions of ourself, and, and it's the only way that we can see. You know, we have perceptions that, the way, that our perception is the only way we can see it. And... For Peter, it was a completely unrecognizable thing that he would deny and turn away from Christ. He just, it, it was beyond him. He could not see it any, any way except that he would follow Christ to the end. But that very night, three times, he denied Christ. He found himself doing something that he was convinced he would never do. Now, this should be a very sober warning to us, considering that this was the same man that was willing to get out of the boat and walk on the water. And now this man has found that he's done something that he, he couldn't believe. It, it, it was completely unrecognizable for him to deny Christ, not once, but three times. I want us to, to go back and look at verse 32 before we go on. I want us to focus on that statement by Jesus. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Now, Jesus restored Peter. The account's found in the Gospel of John, verse tw chapter 21. And... When that took place, verse 4 of John 21 tells us, But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. He was unrecognizable to them. 
And this was a deja vu moment in the sense that they'd fished all night and they'd got nothing. And they were instructed, cast on the other side of the boat, and now their net's full of 153 big ones. And John comes to the conclusion, that's the Lord. Peter dives in, and they drag all the fish in, and, and Jesus has a fire going on, and there's bread on it and fish, and, and, and come eat breakfast. And then he takes Peter aside, and they have this conversation that goes, do you love me? He says, yes, feed my lambs. Do you love me? Yes, feed my sheep. Do you love me? And by now, Peter's exasperated. Yes, I love you. Feed my sheep. And those three questions, many scholars believe, are because Peter denied Christ three times. Now he's affirming three times his love and his faithfulness and his service to Christ. And he is restored in front of the others. You see, Peter's restored. Peter's failed, found himself doing something he, he couldn't believe could happen. And yet, Jesus' instruction to him was, strengthen your brethren. When you return, strengthen your brethren. So Peter had a, a, a word, a personal word, a message to any who fail and find that they've done something that they were absolutely convinced that they would never do. You see, Peter knew, he personally knew that Jesus can completely forgive and restore you of such things. In him that was a reality. In him that was a reality. That wasn't to be an isolated event of someone having a personal experience and now having a word to share with others, to encourage others. The Apostle Paul expressed the relevance of this truth to all believers, and it's found in 2 Corinthians 1. I want us to look at 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation that, when, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. This is a, a truth and a pattern for us. We've been recipients of Christ's love and mercy, his forgiveness, comforted by him. Maybe we've experienced his deliverance, his healing, his provision. And as such, we are to be able to share that with others, the reality of it, to assure them that this is available to them too. Yes, it's by faith. Yes, it's with obedience. But it's available to them too. And I've shared all these things this morning to ask a few questions. Yes, personal questions. Yes, probing questions. And so with heads bowed and eyes closed, the biggest question I can ask is, have you received Christ? Do you want to? Do you want to receive the forgiveness and the atonement that was made for you on the cross? Do you want to receive the abundant and eternal life that's being offered? If that's you and you want to, want to receive that, you want to know more about it, raise your hand. And maybe there's some that need to ask ourselves these questions. Is our obedience conditional? Is my obedience to Christ conditional by my preference? When I feel like it? When I understand it? When I know why? Or have I made a commitment to follow Christ and obey Christ as best I can, trusting him for those times that it seems impossible to me? And have we committed to follow Christ all the way, even when his way is not our way, even when his way may involve suffering and sacrifice? 
Have we committed to follow Christ? And maybe we've failed. Maybe we've done something we can't believe that we would have ever done. Can I encourage you that Jesus can restore you? He can completely restore you. And for those of us that have received the mercies and the blessing and the comfort and the provision and the deliverance and the healing of Christ, are we committed to share that word with others that they can receive that comfort? Are we willing to share it? And so as you ponder those questions, Father, I thank you for your goodness to us. And I pray, Lord, that you would help each of us, Lord, to consider these, tru these, these truths, Lord, that we might submit ourselves to you, that we might surrender ourselves to you as Lord, that we would be committed to obey you, that we'd be committed to follow you, and we'd be committed to serve others. Lord, as your word instructs us. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you and keep you.